when I started this 150 SNES game review project, I did a lot to make sure that the games were kept varied. And basically, there's the set games that everybody knows in Nintendo classics, so I tried to keep them to a minimum. Because it wasn't that I wanted to ignore them, I just wanted to space them out. I didn't want to do like your Metroid, your Zelda, your Mario, all within one week and then be talking about games nobody knew. I wanted a nice mix. The original forum I started to post them on came to a point where it was going to shut down soon though. And this made me decide that I wanted to throw caution to the wind and I wanted to end on a high note by talking about a bigger game. Over the last few reviews before this one I almost stopped reviewing the games and just give stories about the games written with chunks of my life in them almost. You see gaming's had a huge impact on my life and it's not just been the games, it's been the friends I've made through them, the time I've spent collecting them and all of the little things. It has been suggested before that I own too many games, buy too many games and spend too much time on aspects such as cleaning and repairing them. But there are reasons for this. This might be the most personal thing I've written or talked about and it was fitting that I did it when a forum was close to the end, but I wanted to share it now. As a child, as a chubby kid with lots of problems and a bit of an attitude, I was both dyslexic and epileptic, so I struggled at school, particularly in my first year of comprehensive. Lots of people teased me about my inability to write properly, the fact that I could misspell a word ten different ways in one day, or the fact that due to my epilepsy I'd go vacant, I'd have a small fit, what you call a petty mal seizure and I'd just look in one direction, doing nothing, saying nothing for a long time. There were two types of bullying I got. One was verbal, where other kids were... and the other was other kids trying to fight me. Eventually, after a few fights, I got a reputation. The reputation was that I was a psycho, and this was largely because no matter how many people attacked me at once or how many times I not got knocked down, I'd keep getting up and I'd make sure that I gave at least as much as I got. This was a good and bad thing. It meant that I was largely left alone after this, so the bullying began to greatly decrease, but then nobody outside of my small group of friends wanted to know me or have anything to do with me because they thought I was a nutcase. Video games for me even then were my refuge. I could forget about everything. I could retreat into my bedroom and all of the familiar things around me that made me feel safe and play some Super Mario World. With all the secrets the game had, the star road and the connected levels, hidden exits to various ghost houses, there was always a friend who could do a level faster or with more coins and the game just seemed to have an infinite replayability. I've had some rough times in my life and games have always been there to offer a moment of escape, a chance to forget about my worries. It wasn't just when I was a kid though, when I was in my 20s I was working in a pub. It was long and sociable hours, I'd get home um, my partner at the time would be asleep, but I'd be too stressed from my job to sleep. And I'd need to spend time unwinding, and most of this I'd do gaming. I'd walk in the door, kiss my daughter on the head, and then play a few games until I wound down enough that I thought I could attempt to sleep. I did buy some retro stuff back then, but for some reason I didn't focus on it quite the way I have in later life. I suppose the following could go into the why do we retro argument, but that's one for another time. Basically, one day I was at work, I'd been trying to get promoted, and I was also at university at the time, and I knew I didn't have that long in le left at uni. And I didn't want to be one of those uni students who gets a degree and then just uses it to try and become a manager without having worked all the way up the chain, without having earned it. So, I'd already made myself become a supervisor, but in order to be accepted as a manager, one of the things I had to do was be able to work in the kitchen successfully. So I'd started doing some kitchen work, I didn't like it, but it was a necessary evil. I was up in the kitchen one night and I'd cooked all night and I'd, I'd managed it quite well. I'd cleaned everything up and I went through the whole shutdown process, which, you know, it's basically make sure everything's turned off, clean everything up, get all of the rubbish into bags and walk it out and throw it in the trash. I could have just left there and then having finished my job, but I decided that to be nice, I'd go through to the bar area and I'd help them close down. I walked through the door that separated back of house from the front and there was a sudden flash of pain. I had been hit across the side of my head with a crowbar. I could feel the pain explode through my head, my vision blurred for a second, 
and then a buzzing noise began to come from somewhere deep inside my head. I began to gain some awareness of my surroundings again and I could tell I was surrounded by five or six guys and all of them were wearing what I'd describe as Halloween style president masks. Before I could do anything else I was hit with the crowbars again and again from various directions. In the end I took about six hits to my head. I never passed out but things got incredibly hazy from then on. Somehow I made it from where I was to the bar and I kind of felt my way and crawled along the bar to behind it and I ended up in the ground in the corner under the coffee machine. Uh, I was really hazy and there was two girls behind there with me. One's about two years older than me and actually went to my school and the other one's maybe five years older. It became, it was a robbery hostage situation. Uh, some time passed but then one of the robbers decided that he wanted to rape one of the girls. Um, he was approaching and I got up and stood in the way and suggested that this would only happen over my dead body which was probably stupid in a way but I wasn't going to let it happen. This resulted in me receiving a punch to the mouth which cracked one of my wisdom teeth in half. It was a blur from then on but thankfully my intervention was enough to stop him doing what he was going to do and they left with the money. They were never caught, but I remember after they'd left, I got up, I got myself a glass of water, I sat down with the cutlery from the night, because we were supposed to wrap that before we went home, and I'd obviously gone into some state of shock, and I just started wrapping cutlery. And it seemed like the most normal thing in the world. The other people there said they'd found an ambulance for me and I was like, why, what are you on about? And I just wrapped cutlery. The girl that had been in my school that was two years older than me did look after me and was really nice. And ambulance drivers turned up and they did encourage me to go with them. And then I had the horrible situation where I was in hospital on my own in a waiting room waiting for to be seen somebody was wheeled past me on a bed with their face was a pool of blood and I heard them say that he'd been assaulted in a pub and had his face smashed in and I couldn't help but look at him and think that could have been me he's had what's happened to me but just a little bit worse I thought about my mum and dad being worried if I didn't come home and so I phoned them and I got my dad and I tried as calmly as I could to tell him what had happened but to say that I was alright and he didn't have to come and... but he, he came he was there faster than anything and you know I'm grateful for it the whole time it was happening though I was just saying in my head I don't want to die I've got to raise my daughter she can't be without me. I was off work for a month and I was only getting very limited sick pay and so I pulled out my old consoles and began to play on them and something about them touched me. They took me back to a simpler time, back to my childhood and a time when I felt and in a time when I felt the most vulnerable in my life they actually made things seem a little bit safer. They added some normality to what was a horrible strange time. From that point on I began to spend more money on retro games and I began to talk to more people online. But I also realised I was living in an awful marriage. My partner never really seemed to care about what had happened to me. She didn't support me. My mother and father were the ones that were there for me. Who helped me try and piece everything back together. Eight years later I developed post-traumatic stress disorder. And for those who don't know what that is, it's basically when a traumatic situation keeps replaying in your mind. You can hear things and see things that happened before, and you can feel the feelings. Um, and I had to go into therapy for this. Part of my therapy involved having to talk about what happened to me in great detail. But after, in order to calm yourself and try and leave in an okay mood and not leave the therapy upset, you had to have what's called a happy place. A happy place is a place that you go to in your mind where you feel safe and happy. 
and my happy place was in my bedroom playing Super Mario World on my SNES, jumping on dinosaurs, collecting power-ups and finding hidden secrets. I owe the game so much it was there for me during this period. I didn't leave the house much except to go for therapy. I sat and played my games, worked on my systems and tried to put my head back together. One of the only things that could get me out of the house was the idea of visiting a market or a retro store, chasing the various games. I decided that I wanted the thrill of the chase and that getting a game as cheap as possible was the way to do it. I got lots of SNES games and Mega Drive games and for prices compared to now were virtually nothing. I didn't have a lot of friends after this, everyone seemed to be too worried they'd say the wrong thing or they were just far more interested in getting drunk and I had my games and my daughter and that was about it. My ex-wife would go and see her friends and leave me to struggle. She get she got increasingly mean and told me that she wished I'd die so I wasn't in the way and my games became my main friends, they became my life. And yeah. Super Mario Land was one of my favourite of the retro games I had. I knew it wasn't worth crazy amounts of money, but it was worth a lot to me because it had been such a big piece of my childhood. There's hardly any review in here, but the game's amazing. The graphics were so bright, the music was perfect. I'd always find myself humming the tunes, but it's the playability that does it. It's just a simply amazing game. Every success you get feels well earned. Every failure feels like it's purely your own fault. You never feel like you can blame the game or like you've been cheated. To me, the game's a standout 10 out of 10. I'd be able to make a very strong argument for it being the greatest Mario game ever. If you want the game on car on its own, it goes 10 to 15 quid. And this is more than a fair price. It was available on the Wii as a download, and it's available on the Wii U. I know this isn't much of a review, but it, you know, it just shows what this game means to me. Thank you very much for listening.